Thank you guys so much for joining us uh, today on the app or on the computer, depending on what you're using. Uh, we're thankful that you're taking advantage of this resource and, uh, and just hope that it's been a blessing to you. And if our church is continuing to feed you spiritually and being a blessing to you and your family, we would encourage you to continue to give. Uh, in particular, right now we're in the phase of getting ready to build out and extend our student ministry building. So you're already in the app or on the computer. All you have to do is go to Give, and you can set up the giving either one time or reoccurring. And again, we're just so thankful. So I hope that you enjoy the message. Have a blessed day. Hello again. Y'all doing all right this morning? All right. Man, I like the energy this morning. Uh, be able to sit in the congregation and listen to some amazing worship, and I can hear you guys louder than I can the band, and that's always amazing. I really enjoyed that this morning. Um, Pastor Josh went through all of the announcements. Um, I, I have to clarify something. You know, he's coming back next week uh, preaching uh, in the book of Galatians. We've been working on a series graphic and everything for that, and um, it's, it's good to have him back. Um, but the thing is, is, is usually when I talk to people, I say, well, you know, our pastor takes off the month of June, and they look at me kind of funny because you know how people are. They love to judge pastor's behavior. And, um, but the reality is, is I've only seen the guy gone like maybe a whole week. Um, he's been in his office every day studying and preparing for messages for the rest of this year. And um, it's just awesome. It's just awesome to have a pastor that's continuously in God's Word. And uh, that's what we're going to be doing this morning is we're going to be talking about God's Word uh, speaking of you fellas, I know I mentioned it, and Pastor Josh mentioned it, I'm going to mention, mention it one more time, but you guys, if, if, um, if you have not signed up to help in some way with VBS, I, I tell you, you're missing a blessing. Um, as a father, um, even speaking to some of you younger guys, as a father, it's a blessing to me. My son is next door right now running media in kids' church. He's on the media team. And it's a blessing to me as a father because most fathers, you know, we're lucky if we get our kids in church with us. And if, for him to be serving next door, when we first came to church here, um, was it five years ago, something like that, almost six years ago? Um, we had been here for about six months, and I was driving home one day, and I asked my son, he was a little bit younger at the time, but he was serving on the kids' church team. He was a helper, you know, in the kids' church team and um, I asked him when he was driving home, I said, son, do you, do you prefer our old church or our new church? Because, you know, a dad needs to know. We need to talk to our kids about, you know, do you like this church? And we were just getting used to it. And he says, oh, I like our new church. And I said, well, why? And I was expecting he was going to say something like, well, they give me candy. <laughs> we play games. But he said, I get to serve. And as a father, that just that melts your heart. Like, he was so happy that he had a place where he belonged and that he could help out. And so uh, I've watched him grow, and, and my other son's here with us this morning. I've watched him grow, and I'm sure he's going to be stepping up. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk about you this morning. <laughs> Got a message for you all this morning. Um, it's about God's Word. And I don't want you to get caught up in the story because I... In order to talk about God's Word, I wouldn't do it justice without sharing a story from God's Word with you, but I want you to understand that the overall principle this morning, the overall goal, is to show you how amazing God's Word is. And so I'm going to share a story out of the first, I'm, we're going to be in the books of First and Second Samuel this morning, but don't forget that. I don't want you to get caught up, I don't want you to think that I'm going to somehow make this awesome point about this whole story of Saul and Samuel and all of this, but the point is, is just to appreciate the Word of God this morning. I want to start out by asking you guys a couple of questions, though. And first off, we have events that we have in our life that we can remember. They may have happened years ago, but we can remember them like they happened yesterday. How many of y'all, just by a show of hands, you can smell something and you can remember something that happened years ago, like that smell just brings back a moment in life? Just raise your hand, like, you smell something cool, all right? How many of you have something in your life that was just so shocking, whether it be good or bad, that you remember like it was just yesterday, like it just, like it just happened? Cool. I'll ask you another question, because I like interaction, right? I'm not going to get you guys jumping up and sitting down and all that good stuff, but I do want you to raise your hand this morning. I made the mistake during the first service of asking somebody to speak, and everybody got real silent, so we'll try it. I don't know how it's going to go. It's like, you, that's, what, that's what you do. Um, 
How many of y'all remember where you were when 9-11 took place? All right. See, that's a major event in our lives. And some of you, even older than I am, we won't reveal who you are, but um, some of you have even further back memories of things that have, ha- have taken place in the world. And I'm a, I'm a historian. I love to study history. And I remember on 9-11, the, the business that I was working at when I got saved, you know, y'all know my testimony, um, but it was uh, Bruce Hardwood Floors over in Center, Texas. And at the time, I was taking a, a man that, uh, I don't know if you know, guys know how plywood is made, but they have a press that has different shelves in it. And there's a man that stands there and he shoves with a stick. He'll shove this plywood in there to be pressed together in a hot press. And he was a little brave and a little bit too brave. And he decided not to use a stick and stuck his hand up in there just to nudge it. And it crushed every bone in his hand. And so I was responsible for taking him to physical therapy. I know that sounds like a weird job, but I would drive him to Nacogdoches, Texas. And we got there. I got there um, for work on the morning of September the 11th. And it was kind of dumb, you know, we, we got there and my supervisor approached me and I'm fixing to head right out, you know, fixing to take this guy to the doctor. And um, my supervisor approached me and he says, uh, something crazy just happened, man. He said, some idiot flew his plane into a building in New York. And we kind of laughed about it, like we didn't know it was a big deal. And we didn't think about it at the time, like it was real early in the morning and we didn't think about, you know, anybody hurt or anything like that. Like, wow, it's kind of crazy, probably some drunk redneck, you know. And... and um, because that's just the way we think down here. And um, so when I got in the truck and we started driving down the road, we started heading to Nacogdoches and we listened to all the rest of it unfold over the radio. And we even heard on the radio, I didn't share this with the first service, but we even heard on the radio, when they came across the radio and they said, President Bush has landed in Barksdale Air Force Base. And then they came back after the commercial, and they went, we're correcting that. The president is not in Shreveport. He's not in Bossier. Uh, we're sorry. And uh, we heard all of that, you know, over the radio. And there was a point when the gentleman that was with me, um, he looked over at me and he said, if one more plane goes down, take, take me home. Like, it was, we were worried. And I know some of you probably remember where you were at. I came back home, and we, or we came back to the, the factory, the plant where we was at, and they had pulled all of the workers into the front office and on like a little 19-inch TV or so. It was like some TV they pull out of a closet And um, they're watching all of the news coverage. And they sent all of us home, and and I got across that Logan Sport Bridge, and there was just a line of traffic all the way to JJ's Fast Track um, of people panicking because gas was going to go to $5 a gallon. and Like, it was crazy, right? How many of y'all remember what you were doing? Okay, so since I'm not talking to a group of youth this morning, I can ask you guys this question. How many of y'all remember when the Challenger exploded? Uh, how many of y'all were in classroom when the Challenger exploded? See, I was in about, I think it was a third grade. I could be wrong, but it was around second or third grade. I say second, my wife tells me third, you know. But um, well, they wheeled a TV into the classroom. And for you guys that are my age, when they, the teacher wheels a TV in the classroom, it's like, it's going down. Like, it's going to be a good day, you know. <laughs> It's going to be a good day. And it wasn't. It wasn't at all. Um, you know, they're, they're telling everybody that this first teacher was going to be on the space shuttle, and we watched it go up, and then we watched it explode, and that was just silence. You know, it's these days, these, these moments that you have in your life that you still remember the smells, you still remember what you were doing, you still remember where you were, you remember all the details, but then when you think back on your life around that time period, you might not remember much else. And it may be good events and it may be bad events. You know, we've talked about a couple of tragedies here, but there are good events as well. Like when maybe the first time for you ladies, the first, first pregnancy, when you found out you were pregnant for the first time, you could probably remember where you were and what was happening. Or when you found out you were going to be a father for the first time, you guys, or, or when you met your spouse, like some wonderful events as well, they bring back memories just like yesterday, even though they were 20 or 30, 40 years ago. How about this? How about the first Bible story you ever remember reading or someone teaching you? Raise your hand if you remember that one. All right. Fewer hands, but some hands. First Bible story you ever remember at all. Now, when I was young, I had an aunt. I spoke about her when I was up here last time. 
uh, Benny English, my Aunt Benny. And she used to babysit me when I was under 10 years old. And my Aunt Benny, she was a Sunday school teacher, right? And she used to tell me Bible stories. And I remember the very first Bible story that she ever taught me. And it was the fiery furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, out of the book of Daniel. And I don't remember much else about my Aunt Benny today. I have a picture of her, but I don't remember much else. I don't remember like what it was like staying at her house. I don't remember what the layout of her house was necessarily, but I can remember sitting at her dining room table with the Lord's Supper over the table. I think we still have the picture. I at my mother's house hanging over her dining room table. And I remember her sharing with me the Word of God from the fiery furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I still remember that event like it was yesterday. It's amazing what you can remember, what your mind remembers in these major events in your life, and what you don't, the details that it leaves out. And it's that way with the Word of God. You know, when I, when I surrendered to ministry, when I surrendered to ministry um, years ago, I think it was around 2000 four or five, somewhere around in there, I had felt the Lord pulling in my life for about a year. I felt like he was telling me there was, there was something I needed to do. I needed to step out. But the problem was, for me, is that I had convinced myself that I'll mess things up. Up until that point, I felt that I had been, you know, just pardon my French, but a screw-up. I, I thought I, if there's anything that I could mess up, it, it, I could do it. And so stepping out... Because that's what we did at our, at our old church. If we wanted to serve in any capacity or anything like that, you guys know the drill. Most of you came from Southern Baptist background or maybe Methodist or whatever, but you walk down the aisle and um, you talk to the pastor and then the little lady comes down and takes your information and then the, at the end of church they come by and extend to you the right hand of fellowship and you leave there smelling like 50 different ladies' perfume. That's, that's in the Baptist doctrine. <laughs> It's funny. I'm not making fun of it, though. But every church does it differently. But I walked down the aisle, and I surrendered to ministry, and I had no idea where the Lord was going to put me. And my pastor, luckily at the time, he saw something in me, and he said, we, need, we have an opening for an Awana's listener. And you guys know Awana's ministry is up till about seventh grade. And so I got involved in Awana's ministry as just a listener. And I would step outside. I see Clay back there. You were in Awana's, right? Were you in Awana's back there? He was in my youth group. They've been visiting the last few Sundays. I'm good to see y'all. But um, in Awanas, you would step outside into the hallway, and the kid would recite a Bible verse that they had memorized. Right? And so I did that for about two semesters, and then they asked me to be a teacher. That was hard. I, I did not know what to do. I mean, I, I didn't really want to do it. Um, I knew it wasn't in my comfort zone. But I did it, because there was a need at the time, and since I wasn't really good, and still am not good with really, really little kids, I'm, that's why I'm a youth pastor, I like dealing with the older age, I can talk with them and hold a conversation, little kids, I just want to hold them by the head. And... <laughs> but they gave me seventh graders, and with seventh graders around that age, it's not really cool for seventh grade boys to come to Awana's, and so... I had a room full of 7th grade girls. Let that sink in for a moment. It was rough. Um, I was a teacher for, I think, two years, and then they, um, they ended up asking Miss Dixie, my wife, she was the game director, and they ended up asking me to become Awana's commander, and I just kept making steps. And all while the process, I was in the Word of God. I was reading the Word of God. All through this, I was looking for guidance. I had always been taught from a young age that that's where you seek guidance, right? You go to the Word of God, you read stories, you apply them to your life. And so I was trying this out. It was new to me. Um, after a while, I became a youth pastor because our, our youth pastor resigned about three days before camp for a youth camp. And I had never been to a youth camp, and so um, that, was, that was also rough. Um, we took 25 teenagers Twelve ended up giving their lives to Christ, and from that point forward, I was hooked. Now, I want to tell you guys this morning, and I know this from experience because I've experienced a few different addictions in life, but the addiction of leading someone to Christ, that first time, you're hooked. 
when you realize that God can use you, when you realize that you can make a difference in someone else's life, you're hooked. It's an amazing feeling. And so all the while in my personal life, I was a repo man. I worked in rent-to-own furniture, and let me just go ahead and advise you guys on something. When they buy the furniture, they multiply it times four, and then they sell it to you. And when they rent it, they come back later, they polish it up, and they sell it to someone else brand new. Don't do rent to own. <laughs> it was a rough job, like really rough. I, I, the whole time I was at work, I worked there, I think, for I don't know how many years. I think it was like nine years or something like that. I worked in rent to own. And every day that I went to work, I was being screamed and yelled and cussed at. I had to go beat on doors and windows and um, tell people, you don't pay your payment, I'm going to... Uh, you know, issue a lawsuit against you for theft and had to go through many of those. And it, it was just tough. And then I would come back every Wednesday night and have to smile and lead these kids in some form of worship and, and tell them a good Bible lesson. And I'm just telling you that because it, it wasn't always easy. It was rough. And I got into youth ministry and I began to read my Bible a little bit more. And I'm not going to ask you guys this morning what story was it, unless you just raise your hand, but what story it was that you can remember. But Bible stories in particular can help you through moments of your life. And the one that I want to share with you this morning has helped me through my life in many different occasions. But I'll give you a little bit of a disclaimer on it. The first time I read it, I didn't understand every bit of it. And I didn't relate to every bit of it. The first time I read it, there was one little part that stuck out to me that helped me through something in my life, and then I would always go back to it, and I would find something different. And we're going to be in First and Second Samuel. In the New Testament, I think my favorite book is the book of James. Our firstborn son, Hunter, is Hunter James. He's the one that's next door, and I named him James because I just love the book of James. It was the first book of the Bible I ever read after I got saved. But in the Old Testament, I always go back to First and Second Samuel. And so in First and Second Samuel, we start in First Samuel chapter 3. We've been introduced to Samuel and Eli, and they're in the house together, sleeping in separate rooms. Eli is the adult in this equation, and it begins with Samuel, who is young, and it's nighttime, and it says, the word of the Lord says this, The Lord called to Samuel, the Lord called to Samuel, and Samuel replied, Here I am. The Lord called to Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli. He ran into the other room, and he says, Here I am, for you called me. You picture this in your head. But Eli said, I, I didn't call you. Lie down again. Like, go lay down. So he went and laid down, and the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I, I did not call you, my son. Lie down. So now Samuel did not know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And Eli finally perceived that the Lord was calling the boy, and therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lay down. And if he calls you again, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. How many of y'all are a parent in here this morning? Raise your hand. Cool. Y'all's kids have problems sleeping, going to bed at night. We have three children. Now, I, don't, I, don't, I have this problem with my um, seven-year-old. Is it six, seven, seven? Six years old. It's almost seven. It's close. Look. I got three kids. I can't remember all their names. When she goes to bed at night, now you know a child can play all day long and they will wet themselves because they forget to go to the bathroom. But when they go to bed, for some reason, they have to go pee 17 times. It, it's weird how that works. Lily is, you know, is our youngest, my little daughter. You've probably seen a little redhead running around in here. But um, 
she likes to go to bed at night, and she gives everybody in the house a hug, and she tells them she loves them, and then we'll go back, and we'll, one of us will put her in bed and say prayers and yada, yada. And then after, she's in the very back of the house now, back there where the bedrooms are and the living room's down here, and she'll start yelling to everyone in the house, Love you, Mama! Love you, Matthew! We'll have to nudge. She'll say, Love you, Hunter! Hunter's in the other end of the house. And so me and Dixie are yelling at her, yelling at him like, Hunter, tell your sister you love her. And I know what some of you parents are thinking. That's cute. It's not. It's annoying. Go to bed. They know where to get you. They know where to get you. Like, you can get upset over a glass of water. You don't need water, go to bed. I love you. <laughs> I love you too. Go to bed. So I'm picturing this story in my head, you know, Samuel's getting up and running into the other room, and he's like, I'm here, you called me. He's like, I didn't call you, go to bed, like go to sleep. And so it's just a little bit of humor I found right there in the beginning of the story. We continue on with the story of Samuel, and he becomes a prophet as he gets a little bit older. Like I said, again, don't get lost in the details. There's a lot of details this morning I'm leaving out. This is an amazing story. But Samuel goes on and becomes a prophet, and then the nation of Israel begins to ask for a king. Now, Israel is supposed to be worshiping God. God is supposed to be their leader, but other nations around them have appointed a king. And so Israel begins to say, we want a king, right? And so Samuel, the prophet, goes out and he finds Saul. And God even warned him. He's like, this is not going to end well for you. I'm paraphrasing. But they do it anyway. They choose. They said, we want the king anyway. Well, Saul ends up rejecting God, or he rejects God's instructions, and then God rejects Saul. And so Samuel has to go out again, Samuel the prophet, he has to go out again and find a new king, someone to replace Saul when Saul's time has come. So he's still going to be in office, he's still going to be king, but there's going to be another one. There's going to be another one that's going to be raised up prepared and ready to take over when that day comes. And so he finds Saul, or Samuel finds a boy. And he's small. He's considered the least of his brothers. They actually go through all of his brothers first before they get to him. To top it off, he's not only appointed to be the next king of Israel, but he begins to work for the current, very bitter and tormented King Saul. He plays music for him to ease his torment. He's his arms bearer, and it's through that job that he eventually, David, defeats Goliath, which is the biggest threat to Israel at the time. And so David is raised to be the next king of Israel. Now, we all know the story of David and Goliath. I, if I ask you to raise your hand on that one, I, I would believe nobody would raise their hand. Like, we've been taught small little stories in Bible school. But the problem this morning, and the reason why I want you to understand this, is there's so much more. I don't ever want you to get to a point in your life where you accept just the little bitty things that you were taught in Sunday school, and that was, that's just all to the story. Like, there's so much more to the story about King David just individually. So, this entire story is written like a great novel. You can relate to it. As I'm telling you this story, you can envision it in your head, right? I mean, Saul begins to chase down David. He gets bitter and jealous because David, as he gets older, he has all these victories. And they say that Saul has killed thousands, and then they start shouting, David has killed tens of thousands. And Saul begins to get jealous. So he starts chasing David down, and one of my favorite parts of the story is Saul's in a cave. The Bible actually said that Saul was relieving himself. So he's, you know, I had to stop by and go to the bathroom. And he's in a cave. David's in the cave. He sneaks up behind Saul. He snips a piece off of his robe, and then he waits for Saul to exit the cave. And he's like, hey, look, I know you're trying to kill me, and just to let you know, I was this close to you. I'm not going to kill you. You're God's appointed king. I'm not trying to kill you. And they go through this back and forth, back and forth. But as I tell you this story, you can see it in your head, can't you not? In that type of description. It's a story you can relate to. It's a story that you can envision. 
You can see the drama starting to unfold. There's a hero in the story that's starting to be raised up. And then there's a person that is basically turned to the dark side. There's a lightsaber battle. Not a lightsaber battle. There's not a lightsaber battle. I remember reading these stories. I remember reading these stories when I first started in youth ministry. And while I couldn't relate to each individual one, I kept going back. And still to this day, I keep going back. And it's not just that story. It's many other stories in the Bible. And in many ways, you have to want it. You have to read it in that way. Like seeing Samuel get up and go in the other room and just laugh sitting alone. Whether you're a, a reader or whether you listen to it on audiobook in your car, there's so many different ways you have access to the Word of God. And God's Word is amazing. But there's so many different ways I've related to the story. For example, when I became a father... I found humor in that story of Saul getting up and going into the room. And I imagine some of you parents find a little humor in that as well, because you can relate to it, right? I've also been able to relate to Saul and his sin against the Lord, because it reminds me that sometimes I pick my own way. Sometimes I do not follow God's way, and sometimes I try to do it myself and seek myself first instead of God's will first and tr even try to justify it. And I think each and every one of us find ourselves in that situation. I've also related to the young David being underestimated, being judged because of your appearance or your stature. I've been able to relate to that in life as well, even being judged by those that are closest to you. After all, we all probably know in here that those that are closest to you are sometimes the worst when it comes to judging you and holding you back. And that, those are the ones that hurt the worst. I've been able to relate to the older David. Because as we know, David wasn't a saint. I mean, he went on to commit some, um, some sins in his life that he had to work through and repent of. And, and ashamedly, I've, I've had to work through some of those in my own life as well. And so I've been able to relate to the older David at a different season and a different time in my life. And at previous churches... I've encountered others talking about their pastors and attacking God's appointed leader. And reading through that, it, I guess early on in my ministry, it helped me to realize that that's not healthy. It's not healthy for yourself, and it's just not healthy for a church. And so luckily, with God's word and God's strength, I was able to pursue through that and refrain from you know, taking part in, in bashing or talking about God's appointed leaders. I think that's why I love our church here so much. Right? No amen? Don't y'all, I mean, don't y'all just love the way this, this church is set up? We have so many different things going on here in our church, but the ultimate goal is to point you to the Word of God. The ultimate goal is to see you spiritually growing and getting closer to God. I think, I think the old saying that one cannot truly appreciate the sweet until he has tasted the bitter kind of applies in my personal life. No matter where you go, you will have differences. In a room this size, at some point, someone else in this room will rub you the wrong way. It's just bound to happen. Why? Why? Well, the Bible tells us why. We are all flawed individuals. And so at some point, someone's going to rub you the wrong way. But what does family do? They stick together. Right? At some point, I will guarantee you, and it won't be by intentional, it won't be intentional of me, but at some point, I will likely rub you the wrong way. And there's some in here I've probably rubbed the wrong way and some that we've gotten over it, hopefully. And it's going to happen. There's going to be some things that annoy you. But the cool thing is, is that we are all created differently. And we're all gifted differently as well. Just as much as we can see our differences in each other and judge each other by them, God wants us to see the blessings and the gifts that he's given us. Because if you look at that and you say, Lane, 
you're good at blank. I've gifted you to do that in the church. Right? And Josh, you're gifted in preaching. I've gifted you to take that role in the church. Sable, you're good at greeting. You're good at social interaction with people. I've gifted you to do that in the church. And instead of looking at each other and saying, he's different, she's different, I don't like that, that they're not like me. Well, then we can look at each other through the grace and the word of God and say, we're different because God has created us for different roles within the body. And that's what makes it so amazing. When we're in, in God's word, we're able to understand his will. We're able to walk in humility. We're able to interact with one another in gentleness. We're able to bear one another's burdens and forgive one another just as Christ forgave us. That way we can focus less, less on our differences and more on what we have in common, and that is Jesus. See, I've been able to troubleshoot life with this book. And the real reason why I wanted to share this message with you this morning is, y'all have forgive me, but I'm, I'm just in awe of God's Word. I'm in awe of God's Word. It's, it's withstood the test of time. It's still here. The reality is, is Pastor Josh, we talked about this in the first service, but it, it, he, said, he mentioned that, you know, if... If you wanted a Bible, you live in a country where you can go and you can buy a Bible. You can even go to a Christian bookstore and you can buy yourself a Bible and you're not persecuted. But the reality is, is that we not only live in a country like that, but we live in a country, especially in the location where you're at, that pretty much if you were to walk up to anyone in this room and say, I don't have a Bible you're going to find someone before you leave here that will buy one for you. You can even get a free one at the front door when you leave. But we take that for granted, don't we? Now here's the reality. I'm, I'm very particular. I'm not, I know I, I, I'm, I'm not um, great in every area of my life by any means. Trust me, I'm not perfect. But the one thing that, that I love to take care of is my Bible. I'm, I'm, my kids will tell you that I have a strict rule, but don't put your Bible in the floorboard. Because I see so many, I see so many kids or, or adults even just throw their Bible in the floorboard when they get into the car. And what does that do? It just gets dirt and stuff in it. But I cherish this book. You see, God gave us His Word because He wants something more for our lives. He wants you to experience blessing. And, and sometimes I wonder, where would my life be if the moment that I walked down the aisle and surrendered my life to Christ, where would my life be if I had not included His Word? I mean, would I be standing here today if I did not read God's Word? And then, I want you guys to ask yourself the same question. Are you reading the Word of God? Because I don't read it near enough. Trust me, Every time I get up here and I have the opportunity to preach, every single time it's a message that the Lord has put on my heart to convict me of first. I'm just delivering to you what He has shared with me. But are you reading the Word of God? Do you appreciate the fact that you have access to it? I mean, Raymond Blunt, he's, he's a police officer on the force. He was in my youth group years ago. Um, he told me he was stationed in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, and he said when he was down there, they have access to a lot of things. But they don't have access to the Holy Bible because the sight of it will send them into straight riot mode. And as we travel around to different places, my, my wife and I have noticed that in many hotels, they've stopped placing the Word of God in those hotels. Why is that? Because of the power in God's Word. What are they afraid of? They're afraid that it's going to transform you in some way to be more like Jesus. I mean, hallelujah, if that were to happen. Let's move on. First point I got in your notes is this. We'll go through these quickly. First point is God's Word is historically accurate. God's Word is historically accurate. This flies in the face of everyone that would say that they believe that the Bible is a good moral book 
but they just have problems believing certain stories like Noah's Ark and the Great Flood. When in fact, when we study archaeology and when we study geology and anthropology, we find that the Bible is historically accurate. Scientists have said that it needs to pass three tests. Anything needs to be, or it needs to pass three tests if it's going to be deemed historically accurate. Number one is it's got to have eyewitness accounts. Two, it's recorded and copied with extreme care. And three, there must be archaeological confirmation. And for the sake of time, I would love to go into great detail, and I will after service or outside of this setting, but the Word of God passes all three tests, hands down. The Bible is historically accurate. Number two, God's Word is scientifically proven. God's Word is scientifically proven. And I'll give you some fun examples. You don't need these in order to have faith, but I just found them kind of humorous. Um, Number one, did you know that long before Christopher Columbus set out to prove that the earth was round, God's Word was already there? And in God's Word, in Isaiah 40, 22, it says, It is He who sits above the circle of the earth. Other translations say the sphere of the earth. So even back then, they had access to the Word of God, but man is trying to justify things as he always has since the Garden of Eden. He's trying to justify things and not follow God's Word, but follow his own. Or, in 150 B.C., a man named Hipparchus counted all the stars in the sky and determined that there were 1,022. And a man came along later named Ptolemy, and he said, you missed four. There's 1,026. But the Bible said all along in um, Jeremiah 33, 22, the stars in the sky cannot be counted. And in one last example I'll give you all, and I had many more. In medical science, we used to believe that there were four things that basically created disease. Too much blood made you sick. That's what they believed. They did something called bloodletting, where if you got sick, they would drain your blood to reduce inflammation. They literally thought draining the blood from your body would save your life, and as recent as 1799, they were still performing this procedure. And in 1799, a man got sick with a sore throat, and they performed this procedure of bloodletting to him three times, ended up draining over 80% or over 40% of his body's blood, 80, was it, 80 liters, 80 ounces of blood, which is about 40% of your body. Today, doctors say adding fluids and not draining them would have saved his life. Today, we do things like blood transfusions and such. But one clue was already there in Leviticus 17.11. It says, for the life of the body is in your blood. Perhaps, perhaps someone should have told George Washington to consult the Bible before letting the doctors touch him. Because that's how our first president died. God's word is scientifically proven. All throughout scripture you can find different examples like that. And those are just probably three of the six that I have down on my sheet here, and there's so much more. Next point in your notes, God's Word is trusted by Jesus. And this is the most important one. God's Word is trusted by Jesus. The very Jesus that we believe in, not that Ricky Bobby, sweet baby Jesus, Jesus, (laughs) not that Jesus that gets me and that just heals the sick and loves on people and you know, the, the, the gentle Jesus, the gentle giant Jesus with the golden flowing hair. and Not that Jesus, but the Jesus that believes in the Word of God from beginning to end. You know, there's those stories that sometimes we have a problem, like I don't know if that was a metaphor or not. I'm just, it's hard to believe that Jonah was swallowed by a well. Those stories, Jesus believed in them. Jesus trusted the Word of God. And I will take this time to tell you, I shared it on Facebook, but if you guys would, if you don't do anything else this week, go home, watch. It's on Netflix. It's Genesis History. Pastor Josh shared it with me this last week. When you talk about the stuff that I'm talking about right now, there's so much more they can go into, and it is amazing. But the Bible is scientifically proven. The Bible is historically accurate, and it is most importantly of all, trusted by Jesus. 
He said, For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. For us to say that one part of the Bible is hard to believe, or I don't know about that, but I do believe in Jesus, well, you're not believing in God because God is not a liar. We cannot say that one part of the Bible is not true and another part is. It's contradictory. The next, next point in your notes, or the last point in your notes, is this. God's Word has transforming power. God's Word has transforming power. In 2 Timothy it says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent and equipped for every good work. And I think we could literally sum up everything that we attempt to do in our church with that verse. The Word of God is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that we may be competent, equipped for every good work. That's the goal. The goal here is not just to get you onto a team. The goal here is not just to get you plugged in so that you know we'll have somebody at the front door. The goal here is to help you grow spiritually, to get you in God's Word. You can do that through these small groups. If you don't know anywhere else to go, you can go and sit down with other like-minded individuals. Like I said, there's two tonight. Perfect opportunities to go. God's Word has transforming power, and I'll close by explaining why I chose this story in First and Second Samuel to, to share with you how amazing God's Word is. King David went on to be very successful, and he had some major failures. One of his failures was that he slept with a married woman named Bathsheba, and she got pregnant. And then David went on to have her husband Uriah killed. It's an amazing story. There's a lot of details left out in that. And the reason why I started this message there is because to confront David about his sin, there was a prophet named Nathan. And he comes to talk to David and to share with him that basically you did something wrong. You've, you've sinned against God, you've did something wrong, and I need to share with you. But this is the way Nathan approaches David. He says, he tells David a story of two men, one rich and one poor. It's in 2 Samuel, we're going to close up, it's in chapter 12. It says, the Lord sent Nathan to David, he came to him and said to him, there were two men in a certain city, one rich and one poor. And the rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little lamb. The story goes on to say that the poor man, with this one little lamb, it was like a daughter to him. It, it, it rested in his arms at night. And the rich man, well, he had company coming over, and instead of taking out of his own abundance, he goes and takes the poor man's lamb and kills it and prepares it for dinner. And it, the Bible tells us, if you read on, it says that David became increasingly angry. When he was telling him the story, it says David ang David's anger was greatly kindled against the rich man. And he said, for he deserves to die. And Nathan said, you're that man. Because you had several wives, but you took Uriah's to be your own. And he goes on to say, the Lord blessed you, and if that weren't enough, he would have blessed you more, but you, you've sinned against God. And I remember watching the History Channel when they came out with this Bible series a few years ago, and on the History Channel, the guy came out, it, it was so awesome, it got it right to the end, and the prophet Nathan comes out, and I love the story so much, and he walks out on this terrace, and he looks at David, and he goes, you've sinned against God. And I thought, that's not the way this happened. You've seen the commercial. That's not the way this works. That's not how any of this works. I was so angry, I yelled that at my TV with my family. Because the Word of God, it stands. The Word of God is amazing on its own. Visuals are awesome, but the Word of God is amazing. What are you missing if you're not in it? 
Where is God going to guide your life? Where, where is He preparing you? What is He preparing you for? And are you in the Word of the Lord this morning? I've given you a, a wonderful example of where you can start. If you don't know anywhere else to start reading, there, there's a good place. It's an amazing story, and I left out some of the best details. God has a plan for your life, and you, you, you have to stop looking at it like I'm just here by chance or because I chose to get up. If God is tugging on your life to do something, it's time. The wait is over. It's time to step out in faith and, and don't convince yourself, not me, I'll mess it up. No, because I didn't do it by my own strength. It was only through the power of Jesus Christ. It was only through the power of His Word that I even so much as get an opportunity to stand here this morning. What blessings are you missing because you're missing out on the Word of God this morning? If y'all would stand with me. I tell you that lesson this morning because I think it tells us with David that no matter what you've done, we serve a redeeming God. Just like he did with the Apostle Paul and all that he had went through in life and David with sexual sin, God still redeemed him. Jesus is mentioned in the Bible as from the house of David. And I'm telling you and reminding you this morning, if you haven't been told enough, God still loves you no matter what you've done, if He is calling on your life, it is not time to make the decision next Sunday. It is not time to put it off. The time is now. Get into His Word. Let someone know. Join a small group. They're going to sing and we're going to close this morning. I thank you guys for having me.